Hello, everybody. Adam Parks here with another episode of Receivables Roundtable. Today, I'm here with my friend and fellow funny man, Mr. Andrew Romhild, who is a former Navy SEAL. Many of you may remember him from coming out to the RMAI conference a few years ago to talk to us as our keynote speaker about leadership. How are you doing today, Andrew? Good, Adam. Thanks so much for having me on. Absolutely. I really appreciate you coming back on and having another chat with me. Um, it's always interesting. And I know we almost ran out of recording time today because every time that we get together, we just find different things to chat about. And uh, I think on the agenda today are leadership, the economy and <laughs> cryptocurrency. I mean, we went down some rabbit holes today. Um, but I really appreciate you coming on. You know, I've had the opportunity to get to know you a little bit through the years. But for those who have not have been as lucky as me, could you tell everyone a little bit about yourself and how you got to the seat that you're in today? Sure. Uh, I think a lot of you, if you were listening, I went to the RMAI, RMAI conference 2019? 2019. Yeah. And so at the time, I just left SEAL. Well, let's back up. I went to the Coast Guard Academy. Um, I went there from 2005, graduated 2009. And then somewhere along my path, I decided I, I loved the Coast Guard. I, I really was interested in the mission, but I would rather be a Navy SEAL. And so everyone around me, all my peers and my seniors were like, well, you're kind of in the wrong service, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah, well, I'm going to figure it out. And, um, you know, by the grace of God, something opened up and they, there was a program that opened up for in the Coast Guard. And they said, if, you, if you're interested in going through Navy SEAL training, we want to put you through Navy SEAL training. If you succeed, you can do five years in the in the SEALs and then come back to the Coast Guard and kind of stand up like a, a special operations branch. And so at the time I was a senior at the academy, it, it came out and I said, yeah, I'm going right away. And I said, well, pump, pump the brakes. You got to go, you got to graduate and you got to get selected and, and whatnot. And so again, just dumb luck. I mean, I, I graduated and was assigned to San Francisco. And I got picked up for the, I applied and I got picked up for the program for selection. And so I went through a long selection for the Coast Guard. Um, I mean, I don't know how many people applied, but I ended up getting top three pick and they said, okay, you're going to go, which was very, very odd, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure that comes with a lot of hard work. It, it, it came with a lot of luck and a lot, a lot, a lot of hard work. And so I got, uh, I got selected. I went down to. SEAL training, BUDS in San Diego. I was back in 2010. Um, since then, I've had four, uh, four deployments. I've been to four different continents. I've lived 24 months overseas uh, cumulatively, and I've served everything from a squad commander of six people up to a troop commander of uh, 60. And I just, I left, uh, I left the service in SOCOM. Just so down, down here in Tampa in the special, Oper special operations headquarters. And so that's kind of how I got in the seat talking to you today. But, you know, you and I met in 20, yeah, end of 2018, 2019. So yeah. it's good to see you again. It's been a while. No, I, I greatly appreciate it now that we're, uh, now that you're a Floridian, I hope to actually get to hang out with you a little <laughs> bit more uh, on those occasions where I actually get to come back home and spend some time in Florida. Um, so now you're doing some interesting things, right? So tell us a little bit about what you're up to these days. So throughout the military, I, I was, you know, first station in San Francisco, San Diego, New Orleans, Virginia Beach, back to San Diego, and then 2020 moved to Florida. And so what a lot of military people do, well, the smart ones, is they start accumulating properties as they get as they get stationed in different cities. And so I, I bought my first condo in San Diego in 2012, and I took a hiatus. I kind of was figuring stuff out, but I started accumulating properties and, and you know, got, got to one, two, three. And then when I moved here to Florida, I kind of, it was 2020 and I realized like, okay, the rates are still incredible. Um, you know, there's a little bit, of, there's a demand in the market, mm -hmm. but you have to be very selective of what you're, you're picking up. But I have a lot of friends I talk to with real estate. They're like, you're never going to see these rates again in your lifetime. Mm -hmm. You need to buy, buy, buy everything you can. That's a, that's a good value. Don't, don't overpay. Um, and so, I mean, I got, I've got, I'm sitting on rates are two and a quarter. I mean, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't think we'll see that again in our lifetime, but so I was, I was kind of renting these out long-term in the past. Um, and then I, when I deployed, yeah, my last deployment is when I gave it to a friend and he, he ran it as Airbnb. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And I, he kind of showed me the numbers he was getting because I was paying him, but I was also paying well in excess of my mortgage. And mm-hmm. in the past, I would rent it out for the mortgage because that's kind of what the, the market was was demanding. And so I got here to Florida and I said, OK, I'm, I'm going to start doing this Airbnb model. And I've kind of you know worked really hard, made some mistakes, but I've gotten I've, I've done very, very well in kind of streamlining the systems and processes to make the Airbnb successful. And I think a lot of that is just due to the fact that I was a Navy SEAL for 13 years. And as an officer, you take something that's broken and you normally in deployment and you figure out what the systems and processes are to make it work. Mm -hmm. And then when you make one mistake, you fix it and you never make that mistake again. So I've been running Airbnbs. I became a super host within three months of of my Airbnb down here in Tampa with a fresh profile. And people are like, how did you do that? I'm like, it's not that hard. Mm -hmm. Just attention to detail, follow through with everything you need to do, figure out what works figure out what didn't work and don't do that again, and then just repeat the process. And so I've done pretty well. Um, I have a lot of people asking me to start a fund and <laughs> so, so a lot of uh, a lot of military, a lot of SEALs are like, they see the success and they're like, just start a fund. And I'm like, well, I'm not quite there yet, but I'm, I'm getting to that point that I think I can take stuff, I can take things that are underperforming and make them really, really sing. So that's kind of what I do my day to day when I'm not just traveling the world and going to see other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. Look, I, I, I think the Airbnb market is very interesting. And I think as you perfect that model, you know, putting together a fund, I mean, that's, that's definitely something that I, I would look at. Um, that I feel like those types of investments have been very successful in Florida, especially in these more transient areas. And um, I think there's a, a lot that can be said for that, but it also speaks to your management style, right? It's, it's that not just expect that from minute one, everything's going to go right. Expect everything's going to go wrong and fix these things as you go and develop your systems and processes based on the environment that you're in, whether that's a, a battlefield or the economic uncertainty and environment that we operate in today. Now, one of the things that you talked about when when you had done the keynote at RMAI was the concept of the bear in the woods as it comes to leadership. And honestly, this was one of my favorite pieces because for me, it gave me a little bit better of a perspective of leadership, not just within the construct of the corporate environment in the United States, but in the construct of a global world. Um, can we talk a little bit about the bear in the woods and kind of like what that really means? Of course, Adam, you want, you're making me bring stuff up that I wrote in 2018 and I haven't (laughs) looked at since then, but I did write it (laughs) and I wouldn't say I've I've become dumber since then. So, um, so the concepts of the bear in the woods is something I came up with. Um, I was trying to relay, you know, taking, drawing from my years of special operations experience and you know, with this, in special operations in the military in general, you don't get to pick your boss. It's a very interesting and unique situation where you can't quit your position. You can, but that comes with dire consequences for your career. Uh, and you also can't choose where you're going to go. They say, you're going to go here. Here's your group of 18 guys. When I was a troop commander, I showed up to team one and they're like, yep, here's your three platoons. I had no idea who the hell they were. You know, thankfully, I'd worked with one of the guys in the past. I knew him. But um, so in that environment, you get exposed to all types of leadership. You get exposed to fantastic leaders. Some of the some of the best leaders I've ever worked for in my entire life and, you know, been exposed to have been Navy SEAL officers. Some of the worst leaders I've ever worked for in the past have been officers or military people. You know, I'm not going to label, you know, SEALs or Green Berets or whatever it is or special forces or conventional. Mm. Um and so I was trying to break it down, especially for the Vegas thing. Is how can I kind of, how can I distill down to what I've learned over the past at the time, I think it was about 10 years. And, you know, what's a good analogy to say, like when I show up to work. <laughs> and so I came up with a bear in the woods. Um, I don't know how I came up with it, but I said, you know, what's going to happen? Because some of the times when you show up to your office, if you're dealing with a toxic leader and someone you really don't like, when you see them, you get triggered and it's the same, you get the same physiological response as you would if you come across a bear. And so um, I think during that conference, I said, if you were gonna be a leader, because everyone in that conference was a leader and they all had teams and they managed, you know, could have been five, could have been 5,000. If you lead by fear to get, you know, to meet your objectives that you want, this is how your people react. 
And so you're going in the woods and you're walking and your heart rate's normal. You're, you're not expecting to see the bear, but then you see the bear. And so when you see the bear, you, there's this chemical cascade of all these, you know, in your body that happens so quickly. And a lot of what it's doing is releasing cortisol and cortisol is a great drug in your or great chemical. If you need to get away in a fight or flight situation, if you're trying to make a rational decision, think about trying to solve a problem when you're on a roller coaster, mm -hmm. <laughs> think about trying to solve a problem, solve a word, a word puzzle. If someone held a gun to your head, when you have this huge dump of cortisol, AKA you are making your people uncomfortable and they live in fear because of you. Well then all that chemical is being released and your adrenaline and all this stuff. And you can't think clearly. Mm -hmm. And when you can't think clearly, you know, there's all this, it's, it's the cascading effects. And I think we should, we'll bring up the, the graphic at some, some other times so you could see the actual effect, but it, it leads with your people not trusting you um, because there's the fear. And then when, when the people stop trusting you, then they don't want to be around you. And when they don't want to be around you, I've told leaders in the past um, in the SEAL teams, I said, you know what? When you lose the ear of your people, when you lose the trust and the bond, and this is a lot what I say to my junior guys that are leading their own teams, I say, as soon as your guy is afraid to come up to you and tell you what he thinks might be the problem, you will fail. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, that's not a, a maybe. That is yeah. a you will fail. It might not happen immediately, but it will happen over time. Your people are your eyes and ears. If you have a team... You need to rely on them to tell you when you're going the wrong way. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. if there's a cliff and they don't like you, they're going to let you drive off that cliff. And so it's the cascading effect of if you, tr and then the other way around, if you turn it around and you start treat, you put your people first, which is what we do in special operations. Mm -hmm. You put your people first, you serve and work for your people. Then they build that trust with you and they don't have the cortisol. They have the opposite. They have the dopamine and the oxytocin. So that's building them up. And then they want to work there. They want to make you proud. They want to make you successful because your success is their success. So it's a very interesting, um, some of the best leaders, you know, they lead that way, the, the mirror and the, and the window. When mm -hmm. something goes wrong, you're looking in a mirror. And when something goes right, you look out the window and you see the people. Um, and some of the worst leaders are the ones where, they see success, it's the mirror and it's them sitting there and going, <laughs> I did this. And when and I've had these leaders and when things go wrong, you know, even though it wasn't, even though, it, you know, for whatever it was, there's the breakdown, mm -hmm. there's that window and they go, this is your fault. You did this. You, you know, know, I, mm. it's interesting the way that you've, um, you've kind of broken this down because what, what I, one of the main things that I took away from the speech at RMAI was that leadership is actually creating a chemical uh, differential in the people that you're leading, right? And the style of leadership, the type of leadership, like you are actually having this physical uh, or physiological effect on those people that you're leading. And it's up to you to decide whether that's going to be a positive experience or a negative experience, right? Absolutely. Like we, we know that we're going to, uh, we're going to change the people around us. And are, are we going to commit to that being a positive change or are we going to be willing to lead through fear, right? Through people feeling like they won't have a job tomorrow or whatever your chosen fear tactic is. Um, and like, does that, is that how you want to lead your group? And I, I, I agree. I've, I've worked for both types of leaders in the past, right? I've worked for people that were uh, very open, inviting, and never took credit for anything positive. And I've worked for those people who never took credit for anything negative. Um, and they're two very, and I felt very differently while I worked there not just about them as leaders, but about myself and in my own behaviors and decisions. A hundred percent. I mean, I feel like there's a, some of the organizations that have kind of like the Wolf of Wall Street, not Wolf of Wall Street, but kind of like that, you better perform or you're gone. Mm -hmm. it, it, can that work? Yes. Are you going to have an incredibly high turnover rate and are people going to stab you in the back if they can? Yeah, most likely. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, are you, are you profitable? Yeah. But could you be immensely more profitable by taking care of your people and giving them what they need? Most likely you could. That's my view on it. Some people might disagree with me, but 
you know, put your people first in my situation. And granted, I've been special operations for my entire adult life. So, you know, I'm a little skewed, but my situations, if I put my people first and I make sure their needs are met and I mm -hmm. figure out what their needs are and I, you know, and I'm proactive in giving what they have, I've had incredible success with that. It's just, it just works. It's simple. Have you found any, um, any catalyst to empowering the people that are sort like when you're in a, um, a hierarchy structure and you've got a layer below you that's leading the next layer, you know, what, what things have you found to be powerful as a catalyst to empower that group that you're leading directly? I, th I think when you're leading someone or you want to enact change, because that's what we want, right? As leaders, we want, if something's not going right, we want to enact the right change to fix what, the pro what we think is the problem. Um, and I think a big thing is you need to figure out what motivates people. Mm -hmm. And that might be time off. That might be, you know, you really need to do the, like the, the five love languages. Mm -hmm. Like no, no joke. This is, this is serious, hundred percent serious. They've made, Navy SEALs officers enlisted who had to work together, do this together like they would for marriage counseling for a couple. Okay. Because if you're, you know, if you're a leader and you want to be recognized, I don't like being recognized. It's not my love language. Words of affirmation for me, it's, it's like cringy. I don't yeah. like it. It's like, I know I did a good job. Don't publicly say that. But if you need that affirmation, then you, if your guy needs affirmation to enact the change, you need to make sure you're recognizing him weekly in front of people doing whatever. If that guy is motivated by money, you need to say, hey, if you get this done, and the military can't do this, but a regular in a, in a civilian job, you know, you set expectations and clear benchmarks and say, if you succeed and you surpass that, then you'll get that. Mm -hmm. um, if it's time off, if it's him just or him or her just listening or, you know, figure out what the motivation is, because if he's not motivated by money, throwing money at him is not going to fix the problem. Mm -hmm. um, so it's more of, and, and you also need to have, I can, you know, when I'm granted a, a Navy SEALs skin is a little thicker than, than most, but you know, I, I'm, but I'm good cop, bad cop, mm -hmm. you know, I, if, if it, I'll try different things and praise them and say, you know, like speak quietly and really encouraging. But if I'm not getting, if I'm not getting results out of you, I will MF, I will, <laughs> I can be, I can be a very scary person. When, yes. when, when you cross me, I can be I can terrifying, <laughs> <laughs> but no one sees that. You don't, you won't see that unless yeah. it's like, you know, it's, it's a lever and it, cause sure. it's, you're removing all these levers. So I think you really need to figure out what motivates the person. And, um, if the performance is not there, figure out why the performance is not there. It might be him. However, it might be you, mm -hmm. you might not be giving clear direction. You might not be following up or following through or giving them what they need, giving them the resources or even worse, there might be something at home before, if you're a leader out there and, and performance is, is dropping mm -hmm. before you really dig in and want to choose someone's behind, you need to figure out what's going on at home. Because if the dad's sick, has cancer, if the wife is something, if the kids are not acting, if they're acting up in school, you need to identify that it's probably like, what is the outside, you know, kind of factor right now that this guy what this guy or girl was a good performer but now all of a sudden we're not getting what we want you know yeah. identify that before you really just go go, go for the go net. in on them i i've always tried to look at myself first and say did i put this person in a position to succeed right have i given them the tools the functions have i given them everything that they need to be successful okay next step you know what, what's happening at home like what's going on in their world right at home whatever but like what's going on in their world and then try and you know continue to to work down that path and sometimes you find that it is that person or their motivations aren't being met or whatever um but that's that's an interesting approach and catalyst to to kind of looking at that empowerment um i i always try to to uh, diversified decision making, right? Like our, our, my businesses are, are generally pretty regimented, but when we have one of those, if you're coming with a problem, come with a solution and come with a suggested solution. Um, we recently started talking about the, the one, three, one rule, right? Define that problem into one definable problem, three options, and then the best possible, like the best option that you're recommending we move Um, and I find that, that those types of um, 
mind frames and tool sets have been somewhat successful for me in empowering those around me to kind of come with those uh, with those options to solve the problem, but then also uh, their recommendation. But I also love the idea of truly defining the problem when we're talking about a drop in performance or whatever. How are we measuring that, right? Like what measurements are we using? And I don't want to go down the KPI path, but I do think that there's some fairly uh, direct correlated measurements when we're looking at someone's performance or just how they seem to be reacting with a particular job or position, task, project, whatever. Um, very interesting stuff, man. I could sit here and talk to you for absolutely days. Um, we're definitely going to have to connect here soon. And I really want to thank you for coming on and having a chat with me today. I think your leadership style and your methodology that you've developed through the years and just kind of your personality really shines through uh, whenever we're talking about uh, what leadership is. And, and after hearing that speech and getting to know you a little bit, it is something that I always kind of think back to that discussion and some of the discussions that we've had since uh, when I'm thinking about myself as a leader and how it is that I can improve. So for any of you that have not had, um, you know, enough time to, or had an opportunity to reach out to Andrew, um, you know, I think there's a lot of different opportunities to, to reach out to him for potential um, opportunities for the future. Um, but for those of you that are watching, if you have additional questions you'd like to ask Andrew or myself, you can leave those in the comments below. If you have additional topics you'd like to see us discuss, you can leave those in the comments below as well. Uh, but in the short term, thank you so much, Andrew, for coming on. I really appreciate you chatting with me today, and I look forward to our next opportunity to hang out. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you, everybody that's watching. We'll talk to you again soon.